welcome to part two of this myths and misunderstandings about laser technology. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning of the first session, there are two key components to this machine. Regardless of whether I'm Mr. Trotec, Mr. Epilogue, they've all got exactly the same decision to make eventually. Okay, I've spent thousands of dollars on the mechanics of my machine. I've got servo systems, I've got autofocus, I've got every wizzo thing that you can imagine, cameras, etc. But none of this whizzy mechanical technology works without two key components. One of them, a laser source, in this case it's a glass tube, and the other one is a lens. Now without those two components, regardless of the cost of your mechanical machine, it won't work. But hey, let me now jump into the position of being Mr. Ressi. I make the best tubes in the world. Or Mr. APC or Edmunds Optics. We make the perfect lenses. Technology has been around for ages. We've got the best computer design software for lenses. But I'm in the middle. I'm Mr. Trotec. I'm Mr. Epilogue. I'm Mr. Thunder Laser. What do I buy? Well, I can only choose off the specification sheet, say this is the lens that's good, this is the tube that's good. Put them together, they must work. And in general, they sort of do, because you've bought a machine and it sort of works. But the problem is, they don't work quite as you think. I've already shown you that these laser sources, the types of beam that you get from these sources, is to specification, but does that tube satisfy the requirements for cutting material with a machine using one of these things? So today's subject is mainly looking at these because here we've got a teenage child that's run a bit of mock and isn't quite what you think. And now we've got another teenage child that's going to run a mock as well. The predictability of this is just about as predictable as the output of this. Both manufacturers are correct, but here I am sitting in the middle as a user, and I find that they don't work together. Not in the way that you would naturally expect. There are problems with both of these pieces of equipment, and when you put them together, the problems amplify. So today we're going to look at this initially, and then we're going to see how these two bits of kit do or don't work together. So here we've got a CO2 lens selection sheet from a reputable laser manufacturing company. Here's what they recommend. There are lenses that run from 1.5 to 4 inch focal length. You can see that the way that they have described them, it's exactly the way that probably you have been taught at school. Now in the previous session, I used a CO2 lens manufactured from zinc selenide in conjunction with my LED torch to project an image through the lens and amplify it or shrink it to show you exactly that a lens works the way in which you imagine. The light is focused down to a focal point and you can make the projected image whatever size you want. You can see exactly that concept with this picture of lenses. Although these are the lenses that are manufactured for CO2 laser machines, in reality, they're not manufactured for CO2 laser machines at all. They're manufactured for use in telescopes, microscopes, projectors, cameras, anything that projects an image. What we're trying to do is we're trying to focus light energy and focusing light energy is a slightly different, well, I'll change that. It's significantly different to projecting images. Everything that you see on that lens selection picture there is technically wrong. If you look across the top, it says average spot size. Well, they are the theoretical smallest spot that you can generate at the focal point. Note I said theoretical. In practice, you're not gonna get anywhere near that. So the next bit of information on this page is at the center of the lens around the focal point, where it says we've got a tolerance. Now, what is that tolerance? Well, it's certainly not the tolerance with which you can cut. That basically is a tolerance based on the fact that if this lens was used in a camera or a projector or a telescope, if you stay inside that zone, 
the image will be suitably well focused that you don't get annoyed by it. If you move outside that zone, your image will become distinctly out of focus. Now, remember what I said? We're not trying to focus pictures. We're trying to focus light energy. So none of this information is valid information when we're going to use these lenses in a CO2 laser machine for cutting. Now, for the CO2 community, we've only got two lens shapes that we can work with. I mentioned them in the previous session. We've got this thing called a plano convex and this thing called a meniscus. Although computer programs can manipulate the convergence or divergence angle of an incoming beam, generally a lens is designed with parallel input rays. So these light rays are refracted off this angled surface here and move through this lens material. And then as they hit another internal surface, there's a change of density, which causes a further refraction of the light ray. So the refraction of these light rays depends on angular contact with a surface of a different density. And if we look carefully at this lens, what we shall find is the rays coming in from the outside are focusing at a different point to those rays that are coming down towards the center point of the lens, which are focusing down here. Effectively, we've got a fuzzy focus, as I would like to call it. You're going to say to yourself, that's not very good for cutting. What we really want is we need a perfect focus. There are special lenses around that can provide perfect focus. They're called aspheric lenses, but we don't have the opportunity to buy aspheric lenses for our CO2 machines. We have to make do with a much cheaper and more sensible compromise called a meniscus lens. Now, this plano convex lens has got a spherical surface on the top here. This meniscus lens has got a spherical surface on the top here, but it's also got a spherical surface underneath here as well, a concave spherical surface, which puts a secondary correction into the refraction to bring the rays to almost perfect focus. It's about 95% less fuzziness than this, but it's still not perfect. But it's good enough for most instances. I mentioned that these lenses are manufactured with spherical surfaces. The problem with a spherical surface is that the angle of contact between this ray and this surface changes as we move in towards the center of the lens. We've got a different angle of contact here as opposed to here. And right at the central axis of the lens, that ray passing through the central axis of the lens receives no refraction at all as it enters or leaves the lens, which means that ray travels right the way on to infinity. It never focuses. Now that's an interesting concept because if we move just a little bit away from that central axis, where do those rays focus? We'll talk about that a little bit later. This strange effect here that I call fuzzy focus has actually got a technical name. It's called aberration. And one of the properties of a spherical surface is spherical aberration. No matter how good, how expensive your lenses, they will all possess spherical aberration. A correction to that spherical aberration is attempted with a meniscus lens, but it will still have some sort of spherical aberration. Now, spherical aberration is a well-described subject, which I discovered when I read this document here. And there are some interesting pictures in here, which clearly show the sort of things that we've just seen earlier. We've got rays that come in parallel to the axis of the lens, and they cross over at this, what I call fuzzy focus. Now, look, if we draw the outline of this fuzzy focus, you'll see that we get a sort of a wasting effect here because what's happening in the middle here is not a focus at all. It's a series of focuses for each one of these rays as they enter into this focal area. So there is a zone of focus there, not a focus point. Okay, now this is the way in which lenses are designed, theoretically. And we're all told that we must use our lenses flat side down towards the work because that's the correct way to use them because that's the way that lenses are designed. What happens if we're naughty children and we decide to use our lens the other way around? Oh dear. Just take a few moments to reflect on what we've done when we turn the lens round. Look at the way in which we have created enormous aberration. 
the focus on that lens is now beyond fuzzy. It's absolutely rubbish. You'd never use a lens like that in a camera or a telescope because you wouldn't see anything. The rays from the outside are focusing at 24 millimeters from the lens and the rays from the central part, just this bit here, this is not the center of the lens, this is just sort of two thirds of the way in from the center of the lens, are focusing at 47 millimeters. So this could well be a two inch lens, I don't know. Look, spherical aberration has an effect when we look at the picture. What's an average amount of spherical aberration? Well, let's, let's assume that a, sphere, a natural amount of spherical aberration is something like this picture here, okay? And now what we see is a fuzzy image, which is what we predicted we might see. With no spherical aberration, we get a crystal clear picture. But as I said to you before, we're not interested in using lenses for projecting images. That's what they're designed for, but that's not what we're using them for. I give you the example of that lens there, which I demonstrated with my torch experiment. You can't see that hole in the center of the lens when I project my images through it. The center of the lens is having virtually no effect on the quality of an image that's projected through the lens. It's a completely different matter when we start putting laser light through that lens. I will remind you of what we touched on in the last session. And that is that our laser beam does not have uniform light across its diameter. It's not like a stage spotlight. This is a specially manufactured light where the intensity at the center of the beam is completely different to the intensity at the outside of the beam. Now, again, as I demonstrated in the previous session, if we get a beam which has got a small diameter and a very high intensity, it cuts through material much faster than a beam with the same power, but at a lower intensity. Intensity is the thing that damages material faster and faster. The higher the intensity, the faster we can damage material. And that's the whole principle of a lens. Look, we start off with light going into a lens and we focus it down. We make the beam smaller and smaller and smaller. And as the beam gets smaller and smaller and smaller, we don't change the power. What we're doing, we're making the beam sharper and sharper and sharper because we've got the same amount of power, but the beam size is decreasing because we are focusing the beam down towards a smaller focal point. That's how we are amplifying the intensity in the beam. We're making this intensity something phenomenally high by focusing it through a lens. If we put a sharp version of this into the lens, we would expect to get a very, very, very sharp version of that out of the lens. That's an assumption that most people make. A couple of other concepts that we spoke about in the previous session when we talked about the beam. One was this intensity profile here, whereby the more intensity we've got, the faster we can do damage. Now, faster, it implies time. So in other words, if I expose a piece of material to that high intensity there for a short period of time, I just get a small amount of damage that spot size there. Say, for example, where my cursor is, just a very small spot. Now, if I allow more time, then this exposure is getting further and further down the beam because the beam will still do damage to the material even though the intensity of the light has dropped off. That intensity just needs more time to do its damage. So there's a strange relationship which we'll call exposure time and anybody that's familiar with camera technology will understand what exposure time is and understand this perfectly. If we expose material to the tip of this beam for just a short period of time, we will see a very small burn spot. Now, if we increase the time, it will allow more and more of this intensity to take effect. And effectively, what will happen if we draw a line across here now, look, we will produce a bigger spot. But you're then going to say, but hang on, that's a raw laser beam. When we actually pass this raw laser beam through the lens, what it's going to do, it's going to focus the rays down so that all the rays pass through 
a single little spot, a little area called the spot size. So therefore, time does not come into this at all. Because if all the rays are passing through one spot, you could keep the beam running at that spot forever and it wouldn't grow any bigger. The hole would always be the same size. Well, as I mentioned to you before, lenses don't actually do what you think they do. The focal point is not what you think it is. Here we've got a one and a half inch plano convex lens with 70 watts of power in the beam. Okay, it's approximately a five millimeter beam and it was set so that the focal point was at 38.1 millimeters away from this material. Now this material is a very thin card or a thick paper like a cartridge paper. So this has got a fairly low damage threshold. It doesn't resist burning. It accepts burning quite easily. So what it does, it shows you the burning zone of the beam. Not all of it, because the tail end of the beam is at such a low power that it's not going to show on these images here. Remember what I just said to you, time should not be an issue if all the rays are passing through a single focal area, spot size. If we look at this bottom set of data here, the lens is flat side down, the conventional way. And what we see is for two milliseconds, we get the highest focus of energy right at the center of the beam there. And then we get this lower focus of energy, which is scorching around the high intensity spot that's high enough intensity that it's burnt through the card. At 20 milliseconds, we've got a much bigger hole and we've got a much bigger scorch mark. But how can that be if all the light is passing through one single spot size? Okay, so maybe that spot size is this one. But how come this one's bigger? And this one's even bigger still. I'll tell you what, let's do that naughty boy thing and turn the lens upside down, as we shouldn't do. And here's what we get. We get less scorching, slightly bigger hole. But now we get a much smaller hole as we increase the exposure time. Something weird going on here, which doesn't really make sense. It certainly doesn't agree with the principle of a focal point and a small spot size. Because, hey, this is the same lens all we've done is we changed the exposure time and the spot size has changed. What I've described to you so far shows you that there are some strange properties associated with lenses and that no matter how expensive a lens you buy, you will always be buying those properties. And here is one of those properties that doesn't comply with what the lens manufacturer tells you. You've paid a lot of money for something that doesn't work as he says it will work. It works well if you're going to use it in a camera or a telescope, or a projector, as I've said many times before. We are not projecting images. We are projecting light intensity. We want to do damage with intense beams of light. And we use a lens to focus our light down to a very, very intense puddle of light. But that puddle of light is not uniform, because if it was uniform, it would always produce the same size dot but we know that a beam didn't start off as a uniform beam of light. Look, it started off here as a Gaussian distribution. In this image, I've taken the liberty of coloring the rays of light so that the red rays are the most intense rays at the center of our beam. And they drop away through orange, yellow, green, and various other colors towards the zero power, almost black at the edge of the beam. Look, this might be a 20 millimeter diameter lens. We're only using maybe 12 or 15 millimeters of the diameter. Okay, and of that 12 or 15 millimeters of the diameter, can you see these two little lines here where my cursor is now? That really is about the usable power in the center of our beam. And that's what we're going to fire through our lens. So we fire our beam through this lens and what we see is the same sort of pattern as we saw here. But here it had no meaning. It was bland black and white. Here I've added color to try and help your eye focus on the bits that are important. The bits that are important are the red rays. They're the most intense rays. So let's just have a look 
at that top picture, the red rays are right towards the center of the lens, which is that black curved surface. And you'll notice that the surface of the lens is virtually flat. There is almost no refraction taking place at the center of the lens. Refraction is taking place in variable amounts because of the spherical geometry at the outer part of the lens. And that's causing these rays to jump around and move to completely different focal points. So we've got a large range of focal points from black there, where my cursor is, to red here. But what you must remember is that all these rays out here are pretty damn useless. Look, they've got no intensity at all. So we can almost discount anything beyond these lines that I've written on here, say the pale blue. Everything outside that has got virtually no meaning because at cutting speeds or engraving speeds, there's going to be insufficient exposure time for them to be able to do any damage at all. So let's concentrate on just what's happening inside those blue rays. In other words, the beam width that the manufacturer typically describes to us. So the first question we ask is, where and what is the focal point? There may be an optical focal point around this zone here. But hang on, we are not worried about optics. We're interested in intensity of light. Because remember, we've got low intensity at the outside and high intensity at the center. It's the high intensity that's going to do the damage to our material. Let's now zoom in on this area here. I'm, I'm not going to go right into the focal point. We're going to move just a little bit beyond the focal point here because, look, we've got some confusion that's taking place here. We've got the red rays that are coming into a focal point here. We've got the orange rays which are coming into a focal point just there. There's a huge difference between them, even though they are both fairly intense rays at the center of the Gaussian distribution. The other thing that I must point out to you is that this Gaussian distribution is not going to be amplified or intensified as a Gaussian distribution by the lens. Because look, if you take a sample across that beam anywhere, you will not get that shape anymore because it's being destroyed by the aberration effect of the lens. What we're really interested in is not the optical focal point, which is here, because the optical focal point doesn't do damage to our material. The thing that we're interested in is the intensity focal point. Somewhere in this region here, there will be an intensity focus which will produce the maximum amount of damage before these rays start crossing over and defocusing. So there's this vague concept now that you've got to get in your brain about intensity focus as opposed to optical focus. They're not the same. The intensity focus will change as you change the power, the speed at which you run, the material that you cut. All of those will affect the end result that you see on your material. You can't see the actual focus itself. All you can see is the result of the damage caused by intensity. Yeah, they sort of work. If you use 38 millimeters as the focal point, it sort of works. But you move it around a little bit and you'll probably find it works better but you won't understand why. You're not hunting for an optical focus, you're hunting for a, an intensity focus. I've gone into naughty little boy mode again, and I've turned my lens over. Now, theoretically, this ought to be absolute junk as far as cutting is concerned. But let's just stop and look at this for a second and see what's happening with this lens. First of all, the outer rays, we've already decided they're, they're worth nothing. Let's look at just those rays inside the pale blue ones on either side of the Gaussian distribution. We've got a huge focal range here, huge, but there tends to be a range here over which we see red rays and red rays, and they're all focused down into a little teeny weeny area. So this looks as though we've got a whole good range here of high intensity rays to do damage. All the others are being filtered out by this huge aberration. We've got these rays here, which are very intense, and they're focusing, okay, here, 
And as we get closer to the axis of the lens, those red rays will actually cl focus closer and closer to infinity. I'm going to try and achieve the near impossible here and explain to you with one diagram how my two unruly teenage children, the laser beam and the lens, work together or not, and also how cutting works, maybe, and how this and this have to be the right combination to produce the best effect of this, cutting. That's a lot of challenges for one simple little diagram, but let's have a go. First off, we've got our laser beam here, which has got its Gaussian distribution, meaning that it's got not very much intensity damage capability at these outer parts of the beam. If you put 80 watts into a proper A-grade beam, then you will get a certain peak intensity out of the beam. And the manufacturer specifies 13% of that peak intensity, say across here, as being the diameter of his beam. That's how the beam diameter comes about. So we put these fairly low power rays through a lens. So the outer part of the beam has got slope, varying slopes, but the varying slopes seem to provide a pretty consistent refraction, which focuses these outer rays into a fairly concentrated zone, which you might like to call a focal point, a very, very small focal zone. When you amplify almost nothing by a hundred times, you've still got almost nothing. So the power damaging capability of these ray intensities is pretty low in comparison to this surface here, which could be wood, it could be acrylic. So when these rays hit this surface, they're not going to add enough energy to the surface to damage it. They will just heat it up a little bit. Now as we start moving into the centre of the lens, what you'll see is that this, this angle of refraction starts to get less and less and less until we get to the point right at the central axis of the lens, which is this black line, where there is zero angle for the rays to refract. So this maximum intensity ray that's coming from the centre of our laser beam is passing right through the central axis of the lens doing nothing. So let's just call that an intensity of 10. It doesn't matter what the number is, just let's call that an intensity of 10. Well, that intensity of 10 is passing right through the lens. It's hitting the material with an intensity of 10 because it's not been amplified to an intensity of 100 or 1000. It's probably insufficient to damage the material surface. And it carries on all the way through to infinity. In, in very crude diagrammatic terms, it takes two rays to tango. So if we move very, very slightly off this axis here, very, very slightly, we get two rays which are going to focus to a point somewhere. But bear in mind those rays have got virtually zero, virtually zero refraction. So they're going to sit right adjacent to this black ray that went out to infinity and they might finish fo up focusing, say here. And then the next pair of rays come through here, very, very, very slightly further away, and they may well focus there. But hang on, look, these intense rays, they're not working together and as we move further away from this central axis, we will be generating a little bit more refraction because the slope of the lens, the angular face of the lens, is providing a slight amount of refraction to these rays. And as we move further away from this axis, the points at which focus will occur could be here and here and here and here. And as we get closer to the lens, what we find is that these, these coincidental rays red rays will start sitting on top of each other and now what we've got we've got collaborative effect of these red rays which are working together okay so although they're moving away from the center and they're not quite as intense because the intensity is dropping off because they're being collaborative now rather than individual focusing away towards infinity they will start having a damaging effect on this material and what happens when we get a damaging effect on the material? Well, what happens is, if we can damage the material and create a hole in the material, and there we go, look, we've created a hole in the material. Once we've created a hole in the surface, what we've done, we've basically created an orifice which acts as an occlusion to prevent these blue rays going anywhere. And even the rays that are coming in closer to the surface, these, these rays that are out here maybe somewhere, 
when they come through here, they're going to just bounce off this surface as well. And only when they get close enough to this central axis, which may be here, for example, will they start having an effect over time, because remember, power and time are related together. And what might happen is we may get a slight widening of this hole in the top here because of the lower intensity rays being of sufficient intensity over a long enough period to start damaging the surface. But of course, long before that, these red rays will, have be, will be down here. They'll be damaging material way down here, passing through this hole. So that's in effect a very, very, very brief summary, if you can understand what I've said, about how cutting happens once you've created a hole in the surface. The hole in the surface masks off any of these useless low power rays. But the key thing I want to take away from this, it's these red rays that are passing down near the axis of the lens, which are the things that are really responsible for the cutting action. When we've got a glass tube, a DC tube, if we reduce the power on the tube, what we're doing, we're changing the intensity profile of this beam so that it now looks like... Now let's just consider what's happening there. We've got lower power, which is passing through the center, which means we've got rays which are still focusing out here, but they're not as intense because the intensity has dropped off. Therefore, they're going to do less damage at the surface and produce a shorter cut because there's less intensity there. Lower intensity equals less damage to material. If I change the beam power and it will go up like that and there'll be a tremendously high spike of intensity. But now look at that. That a tremendously high speak at spike of intensity is occurring over this zone here. So let's just call that the one inch lens. And if we talk about the four inch lens, the four inch lens is going to look something like that. Now it isn't going to be bigger in diameter, but I've just drawn it like that so that you can see it for clarification points. Let's call this a flat-ish spot at the centre of a one and a half inch lens or a one inch lens, but the flat-ish spot at the centre of a four inch lens is that big. The relationship between the lens, how much of it's going to be focused because we're getting onto a, an angled face and how much of it's not going to be focused because we're still on a flat face, this flat face is going to work well maybe with something like this beam because we're going to focus these lower intensity rays down to a single point. But we're probably not going to be able to cut as deep with it unless we put the power up and the shape changes. There's this weird relationship between the curvature on the top of the lens, the power that you put into the beam, the shape of that Gaussian distribution and the intensity profile and how that intensity profile will be handled by a particular shape of lens. So there will be a curvature of lens and a distribution which will at some stage match to produce the maximum intensity combination to give you cutting. I will be able to demonstrate to you shortly how when we change the shape of this profile, even though the power remains the same, we will get different results through this lens. No. I'm not a magician just about to carry out a magic trick. This is a large lens that I used a few months ago with normal sunlight to show you the varying focusing properties across the diameter of the lens. It's not uniform focus. Up there in the sky today, we've got a bright white object which is firing non-coherent parallel rays of light at this lens. Now I've got to get this lens roughly in the plane of the sun and there it is look you can see the sun right in the center of the lens now and if we focus it down and look how little movement there is on this lens to get it to go in and out of focus and i can focus that sun down to a very very small spot just there and the spot is roughly what three millimeters diameter that's the size of the sun when i get it nicely focused and that's the property of a lens, to focus light to a very small, accurate focal point. And we saw a three millimeter sun on my paper. I want to show you some other interesting facts about this lens when I start playing with the diameter of light that passes through this lens. Look, although I've got this lens covered over, it's these parts here which are focusing the sunlight 
down to the focal point of the lens. There, and then I start moving away again. Okay, so I've got a, a focal diameter there of about maybe four or five millimeters diameter. What I'm going to do now, I'm gonna block off all except a little hole in the middle, three millimeters diameter. And that's at the axis of the lens. Now look, you can see how close I am to the paper. I'm not really projecting any sort of a focal point onto there. That hole is actually obscuring the sun and what we're letting through is just parallel rays of light through the center. We've certainly got no focus there at all. It's, the focus has disappeared. Which is interesting, isn't it? Because, hey, lenses, lenses are supposed to focus. Take this lens to another machine, as we will do, we'll be able to prove clearly that a different beam diameter, different beam size, different beam characteristic, even with the same power, will perform completely differently when we put it through this thing. And we're gonna do some practical tests now um, to verify what I've been talking about in theory. Now, I've got two machines here, machine A, which has got an A-grade tube in it. It's a 70-watt tube from Cloudray, and on the other machine, I've got another 70-watt tube from Cloudray, exactly the same specification, but it came from the factory as a B-grade tube. First of all, I'm gonna demonstrate a mode burn for those that have never seen a mode burn before, so that you can actually see the intensity distribution within your beam. If you've got a diode machine or a, uh, a fiber machine you cannot use this technique because acrylic does not respond in the same way at those light wavelengths. Here we've got the machine with no lens tube in it. I've done a power measurement beforehand and this machine at the bed here after three mirrors gives me 68 watts. I'm going to do a full power pulse just to find out where the pulse is going to hit that material and then I'm going to put a piece of acrylic in that same spot. So I'm going to turn my air assist on manually and I'm going to blow at this because otherwise the fumes that come off will ignite. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. What you can see there is the maximum intensity has penetrated and burnt the fastest because the lower intensity has burnt only out here slowly. So that was just a quick crude test to show you what a mode burn is. I'm now going to go to both of my machines and I'm going to do a mode burn after three mirrors in the back corner closest to the tube and then in the front right hand corner furthest away from the tube. We've got a 300 by 500 that's 800 millimeters difference in the distance that the beam has to travel. Right well here are the results of machine A and machine B. Now, machine A has got 68 watts at the table after three mirrors and is an A-grade tube. So we're expecting to see maybe two, maybe two millimeters growth in the size of the beam between here and here. The specification says that we've got three millimeters per meter of beam growth. Well, we've got about 800 millimeters here, so we're expecting to see probably somewhere in the region of about two millimeter difference in this diameter here and this diameter here. There is a marginal difference as you can see because this one has got the trumpet shape but as I get further away we've got more of a conical shape than a trumpet shape. After nine seconds this one pierced right through the 25 millimeter block. Nine seconds? Well it stopped about a millimeter short. But essentially these look like more or less the same intensity profile across the whole of the table. So I don't expect in any of my future test results to see much of a difference between the performance at one corner of the table to the other. This is an A grade tube. Now this is very definitely a B grade tube, exactly the same specification. Measured power at the table is 65 watts as opposed to 68 watts. But those three watts are not responsible for the massive difference in performance. The major difference is the intensity profile in the beam. This was a specific B-grade tube that I asked Cloudray to find for me so that I could carry out this evaluation work of beam shape against lens performance. And here we see what nine seconds of damage with 65 watts does on my B machine. When I move to the other front corner, Here's what 65 watts is doing for nine seconds worth of burn. First, we've got a big beam, which is bigger than this beam, 
even though it's supposedly the same specification for the tube. So there's something gone wrong inside the tube manufacturing that has caused the beam to be bigger than expected. We can see that we've probably got substantially more than 3 millirad beam divergence because this one starts off at maybe 6 millimetres diameter and finishes up at maybe 9 or 10 millimetres diameter. So that's pretty hideous over just 800 millimetres. We're now going to put essentially the same amount of power but different beam shapes through a variety of lenses. Now in all my tests for experimental consistency I'm going to be using the cheapest PVD Chinese lenses and they're going to be plano convex. I'm going to try and use a cutting nozzle which has got a small orifice on it and in this instance we've got a one inch plano convex lens and you won't find many nozzles that can take a one inch plano convex lens so what I've done I've modified my nozzle so that this can sit in here like that and then I've got a ring that sits on top as a clamp ring and I'm not using my internal clamp ring as a clamp ring for the lens I'm using it as a backstop to push this down and clamp the lens into its pocket so there we are, no lens rattle. Now this is the procedure I'm going to carry out for every test. I'm going to start off with the air gap at about three millimetres because that's a nice starting point. So I'm going to try and find the focus with a special program that I've written, a series of lines, and I think there's now a version of it available to you in Lightburn, but I've been using it for many years. I find this a lot more accurate than the ramp test or even the little spot test that you can do like this. Beep pulse. You know, I mean, you can drop the table down and you can find the smallest spot. But that doesn't tell you anything about the relationship between speed and power. And speed and power both affect the focal distance. And I'm not talking about the optical focal distance, I'm talking about the intensity focal distance, which is what you're really trying to find with this test. side but what you can clearly see three four five six seven maybe eight but I think maybe seven is the right focal point for that lens at that speed I know that this machine would do it at about eight millimeters a second This is a one inch lens. I shouldn't really be able to cut through 10 millimeter thick material, according to all the information that I've been told in the past. Look, eight millimeters a second is virtually through. Slow that down to maybe seven millimeters a second and the cut would, this piece would drop out. Okay, but I want this to be an almost cut as being the standard for my test because I don't want these pieces to drop out. So we've got the thinnest line here at three, four, five, six, seven millimeters, which is about there. Is that the most powerful penetrating cut for this lens? When we turn this over, one, two, three, four, five down from the top, which is that one. And we say, well, hang on. focus up quite as much. I've got much greater cutting power here, look. So maybe five millimeters, which looks like a pretty rubbish focus point because it's quite thick. And that's the compromise you have to make. Yes, you might be able to get more depth of cut, but it would be at the expense of having a much wider curve width. I just dropped the focus to five millimeters. through. You're seeing the trumpet shaped part of the beam making your beam wider. So where is the focal point of intensity to do damage? Well this is the point that I'm trying to make. Lenses and laser beams are weird when they start working together. And now we run the same test down at this corner of the machine. Again seven. 
aren't going to expect much different because this machine is a good tube and it should basically work the same on both corners of the machine. Let's take a look what's happened underneath for the penetration. We don't have the same penetration on here that we had here. We've lost some cutting power because we've moved over to this corner, even though we've kept everything the same and this beam is more or less the same over here as it is over there. But it's not quite, if you remember. The difference is very small. Slight change of shape, slight change of penetration. Over this corner we've got about a millimetre less penetration for the same nine second burn time. There are subtle differences between these two burns. Not quite such a nearly cutting burn as we had there. seven millimetres a second. It looks as though this has nearly popped out. So let's have a look on the back. It's a little bit better than this one at eight millimetres a second. So there's something somewhere in between. These are nearly the same cutting speed, but not quite. Let's just try this experiment one more time with five millimetre focus, but it might not make any difference this time. Well, it made it through more or less. It wasn't as good as a seven millimetre focus. This is my test for a one inch Plano Convex PVD Chinese lens on machine A at the back corner and the front corner to try and find out what the best speed settings I can get out of this lens are. Okay, now this is with the lens the wrong way round, upside down so to speak. What I'm now going to do is repeat this test for the lens the right way round and then I'm going to do it for a one and a half inch, two, two and a half inch and a four inch lens to see what the difference in performance is between the lenses. And then I'm going to do exactly the same set of tests on the other machine, which is the B-grade tube, and compare the two. So there's a lot of work for me to do, and you don't need to be involved. So I'll catch up with you when I've done the results. Well, here we are in the office with a big pile of work, which I've been undertaking over the past few days, testing lenses and laser beams to death. I haven't killed any laser beams or lenses, but it's nearly been the death of me because boring, boring, boring is an understatement. But at the end of it, I got a massive surprise. Let's go and have a look at my results and you'll see how I have been labouring under misapprehension about how laser beams work and the quality of a laser beam. I'm certainly not going to drag you through all my test results. What I have done is to summarise some extremes here, which demonstrate what I'm finding in the middle ground as well. 38.1 inch and a half lens is the smallest lens that most people will ever come across. And a four inch lens, well, that's about as big as most people will ever come across. So I've shown those two extremes and I've run those lenses through the two extremes of the beams that I'm using. And I've got what the manufacturer promised, although it doesn't look like it. This is the result of a Gaussian distribution beam where the very high intensity at the center of the Gaussian distribution causes the fastest and smallest amount of damage because it's running down here very quickly. So this is a 25 millimeter block of acrylic and this took nine seconds. Here is the other extreme, the B grade tube. In nine seconds, it probably made it through maybe nine millimetres. It's a very blunt beam and is nothing like the manufacturer promised me. Here we've got tests with these two lenses with this beam and then we've got two tests here with this beam with the same lenses. Same power, same material, except the distribution of light intensity within the beam is significantly different here than what it is here. So what effect do we have on cutting? We've already talked about this loss of intensity right through the center of a lens, down the axis of a lens. It isn't the correct term, but we're leaking away all our high intensity power through the axis of the lens. So the more the curvature, the better we should be able to capture this part just here. What's happening here, we've got a much wider spread of the intensity across the surface. We're not leaking away as much intensity because, hey, we didn't have it to start with. The line test, the ramp test, or the spot test 
are looking for the smallest line or the smallest spot to define where the intensity focal point of the lens is. Remember, intensity focal point is where the most damage occurs in the smallest possible area, which indicates the intensity focus as opposed to the optical focus. Although the smallest neck occurs down inside the material here, this is still what we would consider to be, on the surface, the focal point because it does the least amount of damage on the surface. And we would probably judge this one to be the smallest line on the surface. That's one millimetre different focus. And the only difference that we've done there is change the shape of the beam. Where can I begin to find a focal point here? You will remember all this sharp energy here is passing through the centre of the lens and it's not being focused. We can't find a focal point. When we get this where the energy intensity is spread out across the beam, we've got less leakage through the centre of the lens because A, it's lower intensity to start with and it's blunter and so this intensity is spreading out further towards the side so we're getting more refraction of the light rays and so consequently there will come a point where if we look along here we shall find that hey we've got a focus so same lens different intensity beam no focus focus let's compare the difference in cut when we're leaking away most of the high intensity power through the center of the lens it's not doing a very good job of cutting is it whereas this one look at the cut for what we consider to be a very very substandard beam this is far from what the manufacturer promised us no manufacturer of lenses will have ever done this work no manufacturer of laser tubes will ever have done this work i'm stuck in the middle here I'm uh, Mr. Tr Mr. Trotec, who will never have done this work. Mr. Thunder Laser, who will never have done this work. And Mr. Epilog, who will never have done this work. They're assuming that two black boxes going together will work because the specifications appear to be good for each black box. And I've demonstrated here that these black boxes are not what they seem. And let's take a look at what happens when I just turn the lens over. Nothing else has changed. Let's hunt for the focal point. I would probably choose that one there using the dodgy beam. One, two, three, four. Well, there is very definitely the focal point as opposed to one, two, three, four, five. It's one or two millimeter difference in its focal distance. And all we've done is change the shape of the beam. So the beam shape has a significant effect on the intensity focal distance. Well, we're struggling to find a focal point again because even though the lens is this way round, it's still going to leak all that high intensity power through the central part, the, the flattish part of the lens, which is now upside down. Let's take a look at what the dodgy beam looks like. I'm going to suggest the focal point is here and this appears to have no focal point at all. Regardless of whether we use the lens the right way up or the wrong way up, the problem is the same. This beam here is better for cutting than this beam overall, which is a massive surprise to me. I've always believed that that is the perfect beam because that's what the manufacturer tells me. I've never done this work before, but now that I've done this work before, all I've got is evidence in front of my eyes. I can't disbelieve what I see. I've always known that lenses are dodgy, but I've never suspected that the laser beam was dodgy as well. Now what I will say is that some of the other results that I got were giving me differences between here and here of maybe as much as three millimeters of change of focus. Now what's the point of leveling your table up when you've got three millimeter change of focus as you move from one shape beam to another shape beam? I have to be honest, I thought that the intensity focal point was a function of speed, power and material. I didn't realise that there was a fourth, the intensity distribution within the beam itself. Most people set their autofocus up with the number that they're given by the lens manufacturer, i.e. the optical focus. Totally wrong. If you're going to reduce the error that you can produce with your autofocus, you need to test 
your material because it will change by material by speed and by power so once you fix the speed power and material you should run this test here to see where your best intensity focal point is and that is the focal point that you should be setting your autofocus up on it doesn't guarantee that you're going to get precision results because you've still got this factor to take into account as your lens changes shape across the width of your machine but at least it will be a lot closer to reality than using the manufacturer's optical focal point there's some myths there that have been blown out of the water and a big surprise for me here's the cutting speed chart that i promised you you can pause your machine and study it and as you'll see there's not a huge difference in the cutting speeds between machine a and machine b let's just go back to the myth about kerf and focal distance there we see a whole range of cuts from different focal lengths and different beam shapes now the immediate surface damage is one thing but the cut width well the cut width seems to be pretty constant whatever lens whatever beam whatever orientation of the lens you throw at the material so is that another myth dismissed here we are at the website of the very famous tube manufacturer Resi, Resi, Recci, tomatoes, tomatoes, who knows? They claim to have a beam quality 95% as opposed to 98%, which means that it conforms very, very well to the Gaussian distribution. And here we see a 3D map of the intensity within their beam. But on the basis of this research, it seems that that laser beam quality is not what we want. We want a very soft beam to work with a whole range of lenses because this stuff leaks through the center of a lens and this stuff here does not and it gets focused big surprise so thanks for your time and i'll catch up with you in another session